So before uh, I hand it over to our founder of Zahara's Dream, uh, just to give everybody, all the attendees a quick notice, we got put into the wrong format. It's supposed to be a meeting format. So we're gonna do the, the panel discussion through here. Um, but then for the workshop format, um, I will put a link into the chat of the room that we're gonna switch into. So um, stay, I'll, I'll guide us all through later on, but just to raise that now, because we do wanna interact with you all more than this webinar format. Um, so now I'll, I'll turn it to you, Verlaine, to kick us off. So much, Jess, thank you. That's, uh, that's indeed a bit of a bummer, but we're, we're rolling. <laughs> Are rolling. So I'm going to make a quick introduction. Um, I would like to start by welcoming everyone, uh, all of our sisters or brothers connecting from around the world today for this great workshop we have on the power of feminist leadership that is curated and brought to you with a lot of love from Zara's dream and our fair share of women leaders sisters. Uh, I would like to give a special shout out as usual to our young women sisters who are connecting today to learn, to share, to inspire, get inspired. I would like to also sincerely appreciate the incredible women you're going to hear today and who are going to feed your heart and mind with their words and experiences. Our sister Helen of Fair Share, Emily Bove, our incredible sisters Rupada, she's here, Abu Sede, Arizo, and Moana Hamisi. So we're present here today because we believe in feminist leadership. Why do we believe in feminist leadership? We hear so much about feminism. Well, because feminist leadership matters and it works. Having equal and fair representation of women and young women at the tables of decision-making matters. It matters for women and men, of course, but it matters on a grander scale to help us build more inclusive, sustainable, and positive societies. Building Believing in building feminist focus spaces is looking at how the table is set. It is listening to who gets to speak. It is ensuring intentionally that all voices are included. And here I'd like to stress on the importance of intersectionality and also ensuring that the inclusion of BIPOC and LGBTIQ uh, plus voices. Feminist leadership is also about looking at the menu and how the table is set. Do we like the flavors on the menu? If yes, how do we innovate? How do we cook better meals together? And if not, how do we update the menu to reflect not only the flavors of our times, but also address longstanding injustices such as exclusion, racism, uh, which is on the rise. We've seen it in the US, unfortunately. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a tragedy. Uh, young women, Asian young women have been attacked, uh, black women, black men. Um, so it's really looking at how do we come together to stop all those elements that impede and hold our growth process as humanity. And leadership, feminist leadership is also going beyond having a beautiful cherry on top of a cake. It's very important to stress that. It is about cooking a cherry cake, not just putting a nice cherry on top of it and saying, yeah, we have a beautiful cake. It means having meaningful and inclusive participation of all members of societies in sectors that affect us all as, hum as the human family. I have in mind, of course, political, social, economic, health, environment, and other sectors. So as you can see, feminist leadership matters. It matters for everyone and for our world, particularly as we're set and ruling to build back better and stronger in the response to the COVID-19 pandemic and to the many challenges that we're now facing as a consequence. This is why we also launched our stream a year ago on the occasion of International Women's Day on the 8th of March, 2020. And since our launch, we have expanded to over 2000 members worldwide, including in the US, in Canada, in Latin America, in Africa, in Europe, in Asia, with an incredible dedicated team that is pouring love to help young women Young Women's Leadership Flourish. And here I'd like to give a special shout out to Jessica and Agostina who put so much love for today and support young women's efforts in leadership. And for this reason, we're going to continue our world tour. We're kicking, we're kickstarting today in New York. We'll stop in Abidjan next May, in Paris in June to discuss new tech and innovation. We'll go to Nairobi in September. 
to Johannesburg in um, November to discuss young women's leadership, mobilizing for life and dignity in the face of gender-based violence. I have said it earlier this week when I joined CSW, uh, one of the side events with young women, transformative change requires a quantum leap. It requires all of us to step in, to lean in, to lead. And for this, we really need community. We need a global community to build this positive change, to build back better. And it starts with all of us. It starts with you. It starts with me. It starts with her, him, them, everyone. And it starts now. It's not an easy journey. There are many, many roadblocks along the way to inscribe feminist leadership into mainstream. And for this reason, we need to be strong and we need to come together. We need to tap into our inner and collective strength into our common power. And this is where we're here today. And I'm very much looking forward for you to hear, to feel, and to get all the amazing contributions that our sisters are going to give, are going to share, uh, so that you can yourself, you know, grow and become uh, great leaders uh, for today and for tomorrow. So remember that change always starts with you and it starts now. Thank you. Thank you, Verlaine, for kicking us off. Uh, couldn't have found better words. So thank you for setting the stage. I'm really honored and excited to co-host this together. I'm Helene, I'm the co-founder and executive director of Fair Share of Women Leaders, which is a still rather young, now two-year-old initiative to advance more women in leadership positions in the social impact sector. So NGOs, civil society organizations, foundations, because if we as a sector are to increase women leadership and women's and girls' rights around the world, we have to walk the talk in our own structures. And that's what we're working towards at Fair Share. We do this in two ways. One is we measure the number of women in leadership positions, and we've just published our latest numbers on that. And um, we work on feminist leadership and advancing feminist leadership practice and tools because in order to really increase representation, we have to create a new culture that's based on feminist leadership tools, approaches, and a culture that is true in representation, participation, and um, true intersectional approaches to how we lead our organization and who leads our organization and who is part of the decision-making in a sector that is um, there to advance participation and inclusion around the world. And uh, I do this together with Emily, who will introduce herself uh, later on, and who's the founder of the Feminist Leadership Project, where we uh, introduce a number of feminist leaders from around the world. And together, we work with uh, four other amazing women leaders um, in what we call the Action Circle, where we started to identify, discuss, exchange, disagree on what feminist leadership means to us and how we try to build it into our everyday professional but also personal lives. And that's what we will share a little bit later on and will hopefully guide us through our breakout sessions. So um, I'm really looking forward to especially discussing this with everyone here to learn from you and hear from you so that together we build our understanding of feminist leadership. And uh, with this, I'm really happy to hand over to Jessica, who will lead us to the panel now. Thank you, Helene. Uh, and hello, everyone. So my name is Jessica Rowland. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I am the North American Engagement Lead at Zahara's Dream and today's moderator for our important panel discussion on the power of feminist leadership. Today, I am joined by four powerhouse feminist leaders who are driving the force for change in their perspective fields. First, I'm joined by Rupa Desh, who is the co-founder and CEO of the World Women Foundation, a global initiative which aims to mentor 1 million women by 2030. Rupa is the first Indian American managing director of the world's largest women's entrepreneurship network record, recognized by the White House. Second, I am joined by Abosede George Ogan, who is a tri-sector leader with over 17 years of experience working across the nonprofit, private, and public sectors. 
Bose is the co-founder of Elect Her, an initiative seeking to increase women's political participation in Nigeria through addressing behavioral change, skills development, and funding mobilization with the goal to encourage, engage, equip, and enable women to decide to run and win elections. Third, I am joined by Moana Hamzi Singano, who is the head of programs at the African Women's Development and Communication Network, FEMNET, with extensive experience in socioeconomic programming, policy advocacy, and development campaigns. Mishi has been promoting women in all of their diversities for over 10 years. Finally, I am joined by Arzu Najibzadeh, who is the founder and managing director of Platform, a nonprofit organization that builds civic leadership capacity among Black, Indigenous, and racialized young women and gender diverse youth. Under Arazu's leadership, Platform has invested in over 1,000 young women and gender diverse youth potential to redefine civic leadership and drive change in their communities. Arazu regularly lends her expertise to organizations seeking to develop meaningful and solution-focused understanding of intersectionality and anti-oppression to advance equity. So before we begin, I've instructed this to our, uh, our panelists, but let me just say and reiterate this, this is a safe place to share and to be honest in our experiences. As we say at Zahara's dream, we want you to be your true and authentic selves. So please don't help hold back in your honesty and in your reflections as there's much to learn and address in our sectors uh, to really and embody an advanced feminist leadership. And I've seen some of our attendees and I know they feel the exact same way. So with that note, uh, first let me turn uh, my first question to Mishi. Uh, Mishi, what was an impactful experience of leadership for you when you were younger or just entering the workforce? Thank you so much, uh, Jessica, and I'm honored to be the first one. I think uh, the most impactful, so first, taking a step back, I'm coming from and been born and raised in a very conservative Muslim culture, uh, uh, which is mixed both uh, with Islam, but also with a coastal culture. So in the community that I come from, it wasn't expected that a woman will go on and get in a career, but also uh, to be an independent self. So unfortunately, uh, as it was expected, by my community, when I got to the to the space, uh, to the working uh, space, into the workforce, the first thing I've been told it's everything against uh, my community. So I was told to be a professional, you need to take off your scarf. To be a professional, you need to wear uh, uh, dark color clothes, and I love colors. So I had to change myself to to fit in what is called a professional culture. And that created a complete backlash between me, myself, but also my community in the, in the workforce. So I could see myself struggling, not fitting to the space because the space was not meant for me and I had to push myself in. And everyone around me would tell me like, that is the, that's the way you have to, that the ladder you had to climb. And, Years on, on, on my career, I came to realize as I was trying to mentor and go back to my community, I don't see the same girl climbing the same ladder. And I had an opportunity to sit uh, with young girls a uh, few years ago. So, I, I mean, I should say uh, all that happened. So for first five, six years of my career, I didn't have my scarf on. I would have been like a typical professional, uh, women as we have expected. But then I realized that I, there was a total disconnect. I wasn't happy in the space that I was, I was, but also I didn't bring my community with me. And until I realized that and had a conversation, for example, with girls and said, why are you not, for example, engaging in the NGO space? Why are you not being an activist? And the honest answer which hit me, they said, Muslim cannot be feminist. Muslim cannot be activists. And that's why we don't see uh, a Muslim 
who is an activist and feminist is still wearing their hijab. And that's when I realized that possibly my mentorship was wrong. And I realized that I'm doing a lot of disservice to myself, but also to the community by denying who I am. So I have to bring back that authentic me and my community with me so that to be able to, to be us. And that's why I'm here today. That's really powerful what you said about having this backlash against yourself, you know, and your identity. I mean, I don't know about you all, but this whole idea of wearing skirts all the time, especially now after uh, the pandemic, I'm ready to go back in uh, sweatpants and being like, listen, you saw we all did our work just fine. <laughs> Doesn't matter what we're wearing. Um, so I'm gonna I'm with you. I'm gonna create a movement on that. <laughs> um, second question and um, everyone else feel free to jump in if you have something you want to add. Um, but the second question I would ask to Rupa, so did you have a mentor when you first started your career? And if so, what did you learn from them? And, or, or if not, what do you wish someone would have told you that you know now? So thank you, Jessica. But to just uh, to build on what Mishi just said about bringing your community and culture uh, to really uh, accelerate your work is, is key, you know? I equally come from a very small town in India. I'm the first girl to get education. So pretty much I did not grow up in an environment um, of great mentors or neither role models that I can look up to. However, however, uh, um, there were, uh, also people never had television like at home. I did not grow up a time when we had cell phones so you can just go uh, right and left and, and figure out you know who is doing what maybe you know pick up from people. Uh, but we had a television I used to watch a show uh, that was very specific to a woman being a police officer. And I was quite drawn to that character. My mother would often think that I would end up becoming a police officer. But what I was attracted was a woman's ability to be subtle, to be bold, um, to make her point and, and become the leader in the community. I, I really liked the qualities she had, but not so much uh, she as the police officer. Um, I, I, I was not thinking of becoming a police officer. Um, which really had a big impact. So for me, a virtual or a digital role model really worked because I did not grow up around any role models as such. The one thing that I learned from that, you know, virtual experience or my digital relationship with that uh, woman who was a police officer is knowing your worth and asking for it whenever you have an opportunity. For an example, when I first got my first job in, in, in a big city, in, in a major uh, media company, um, there was one particular project that the company had and they could not find anybody but because they were looking for a specific kind of women. To, to fit into that project. And I could understand that. They were looking for a woman who is soft or who does not look like a very authoritative, but yet she can get the work done. I said, oh, wow, that's interesting. So I'll take that job. So my, my boss gives me the job. I said, I'll take it, I'll get it done. So being, the, being a woman, we do have some advantages and, and don't hesitate to use that when you have to use it and go for it and take that position and I, I took that project but I, I walked into his room I said how much extra would you pay me for it he did not expect me to ask that question to him because he thought she's already getting a salary she will always do it for what she's getting this is just I want my work to be done and that's the time I utilized the same rule know your worth ask for what you worked for and get it done. And never hesitate to tell I'm a woman and this is the job I can get, get done. Because we do have some distinct, you know, capacity to do certain jobs done. And, and I own it and I, I take it, but I ask for the value um, that I'm worth for. 
that's inspiring. Knowing your worth, asking for it when you have an opportunity and getting it done. So uh, Verlaine, there's our t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, let me turn uh, for my next question to, uh, to Bose. How can we shift the dynamic of a mentor-mentee relationship when we notice it's following traditional dynamics. So this one-way relationship where maybe the older, more experienced person is sharing their expertise and wisdom rather than accepting what the younger or less experienced person is wanting to say. Thank you for that question, Jessica. So I think that every relationship ideally should have a purpose, right? Whether this is a mentee and a mentor, and it will be really useful to establish, you know, a purpose for that relationship early on so that both the mentor and the mentee understand the value that they will bring to the relationship, right? And I think that that's so important because, as you know, when there's this concept of mentor and mentee, there's already power dynamics at play. So, we want people to be good people, but pending, you know, when you can't really control the dynamics of that relationship, it will be very important for a mentee to understand the value that they bring to that relationship. I think the simple one these days is that a lot of young people can bring digital knowledge and, and, and understanding to an older mentor, right? Especially in this day of COVID. Um, so imagine that you were, you know, I somebody was your mentee and all of a sudden you have to go into this, you know, kind of online world where you have to work on files, you have to sign. You can literally reach out to your mentor and say, I understand there is a shift. Let me know if you need any support with, you know, creating your um, graphics or, you know, I can take you on a Zoom um, lesson or something like that, just because young people know how to adapt. So again, I think it starts with understanding the purpose of the relationship, because again, it can be time bound. Some relationships are time bound, which is this is the reason why this relationship exists. And I'm going to help you to this point, And that's it. But within the context of that relationship, understanding the purpose and understanding the value. I think that value does is not discriminatory, if you know what I mean. Um, value speaks for itself. So I think that that's a good way to shift the dynamics, especially um, uh, with regards to empowering the mentee um, with a mentor. Yeah, understanding your value, reiterating again, that's what Rupa was saying, and, and understanding the purpose of, of your relationship um, is so powerful. And, and I think, you know, shifting those power dynamics going in and, and having that knowledge. You know, a lot of us, I know we've gone into these things and we've had no idea. We're just like navigating it once we're in, we've got it, we're trying to figure it out. But having that knowledge um, and embodying that knowledge before, you know, it, it does shift that. Um, let me go to our uh, next question for Arzu. What is one concrete way you try to put feminism into practice as a leader or mentor? Such a great question. Um, again, I just want to reiterate everything else that folks will, were saying. Spe uh, specifically, I love what Mishi brought up uh, in terms of patriarchy. Um, I was watching a video with Bell Hooks on Cornell West last night, and they were talking about, you know, the imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy. And I just want to mention that as a Muslim settler in Canada, right? The, the fact that patriarchy is so ingrained in different cultures through different processes and different spaces, I think that really impacts how young women, specifically black indigenous and racialized women, depending on where you are and what your relationship to that political system is show up to decision-making spaces. So it's, it's really interesting how, um, again, the freedom to be me was so much more afforded to me when I was living in a country like Iran, where, you know, I, I was the majority. Um, I realized that, again, minorities have their own issues back there. But 
um, to really, again, come and through a process of racialization, through my um, immigration experience in Canada, now have to face this white capitalist patriarchy that um, exactly as Mishi said, told me that you have to act like a white man, you have to be the loudest in the room, you have to have a firm handshake, and you have to dress like business formal to be in these spaces. That really, uh, in the beginning of my engagement process, back when I was 15 or 16, had really terrible mental health effects on me and really limited how I was showing up to political spaces and what I was demanding for. It really limited my ability as a feminist, or at least what I thought was feminism back then, within the very like liberal traditional confines of like, you know, white feminism. Um, I wasn't able to really advocate and say the things that I knew had to be said and do the things that would mitigate, mitigate and at least reduce the harms of white supremacy onto some of the young women that now I'm working with. So for me, being a feminist leader and bringing feminist values into my everyday life and everyday leadership is recognizing that so much of what we were, uh, we've been talking about around gender equality, specifically in North America, Latin America, um, in the continent of Africa, again, realizing that Africa is not just one country and it's, it's a continent and each country has different histories and relationships with gender equality, how, gender equality has existed in so many of our cultures and so many of our religions, so many of our um, countries prior to colonization. So for me, it's not much more about, it's not much about bringing feminism into our everyday lives, but it's about decolonizing and understanding the effects of colonialism and patriarchy around how we organize ourselves, how we understand ourselves, and how we show up for our relationships to the world and to each other. So in Canada specifically, I'm looking at the final reports of the inquiry into the murdered and missing Indigenous women, how it has specific recommendations for day-to-day -day Canadians. This is how you decolonize. This is how you stand up for Indigenous women and girls and trans and two-spirit people. Uh, when we look at the history and the breadth of Jewish feminism, Black feminism, how deeply ingrained ideas of gender equality are to liberation movements. Uh, I, I, I think all the information is out there. It's really they're out there for us to, to find. So the moment you snap out of this imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy, you are suddenly faced with history and ongoing work of really rich gender equality movements that have been happening hand in hand with decolonization movements, with racial justice movements. And I think for me, it's really about that, of building those relationships, understanding how patriarchy and colonialism and white supremacy really set out the frameworks for how we understand ourselves and really take an anti-oppressive lens at working back from there and really coming back into who we are and what we can learn from each other. I loved what you just said about how we show up for our relationships, because I think sometimes we all forget for better or for worse, you know, if we're dragging along our, in, the impacts that we faced along our career journeys, and we're throwing that onto other people, whether knowingly or unknowingly, you know, that impacts generations after generations. Um, and I've seen it time and time again, of just people unloading the, the things that they're carrying. And, you know, you mentioned, you know, the mental health impact that that had on you. And I know it's had on a lot of us here today um, and how we, you know, address that. So we, you know, don't continue to carry that, that burden and, and to keep that, you know, cycle of, uh, patriarchal, you know, uh, formats going and say it nicely. <laughs> but uh, and the next question that I'm really excited to ask. So Mishi, when I was thinking about this event in the very beginning, you were actually the first person I thought about. Because I remember a conversation that we had when we were at a very large table with some very important people, where you pointed out there's a difference between women's leadership and feminist leadership. And you were very eloquent <laughs> in how you presented uh, the differences in, in, that, in those terms. And so let me ask you, 
what are some of the barriers that you've seen to advancing feminist leadership and mentorship? And what can we do to address them, especially in comparing that to advancing women's leadership or mentorship? Thank you, Jessica. Uh, you took me back to the memory lane on, on that conversation. Indeed, I think, uh, I think as a feminist, we do know that uh, uh, patriarchy is the system of oppression which privileged men. And we also do know that uh, the, the perpetuator of the system can both be men or women. So it's not genetical that every woman become feminist because we have a woman who have been cultured and have learned to serve the system of patriarchy system. So the world has uh, looked for feminine leadership with assumption that every feminine body embodies uh, the feminist value. And we do know that is not automatic. And to me, I think that the challenge has been, even us in the movement, we tend to assume that every feminine body is a feminist. And we had that assumption. And because of that, we are not doing the hard work of, uh, 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 we are not doing the hard work of getting this leader to unlearn the patriarchy, to them to understand the feminism and why we are doing the work that we are doing and how it's important for them as a female body also to be a feminist because you can be a female body without being a feminist and you can be a female body who is advancing, perpetuating and championing a patriarchal culture. And we have seen that. And often than not, we get it to the point where, for example, the patriarchy uh, in men bodies they will use the patriarchy in female bodies to fight the feminists. And it has been continued to be the battle between you women without understanding that this is the battle of ideology and positioning, which is not genetically acquired. And I think it's, it's that conviction of understanding of what's the difference in what we fight for. So I think to me, part of the biggest challenge in mentoring is we that one, as I say, that assumption that all women genetically, automatically will be, uh, uh, will be feminist and they will have uh, women by the time. And, and that uh, partly is also uh, part of the problem. For example, in the mentorship, I come from a culture where we had mentors. We had a culture uh, where as, when I get to age eight or age nine, I've, I'm given a person who will look at after me, you know, who will give me the guidance on how to be, to prepare for my puberty, uh, to prepare for my best uh, menstrual, etc. And I'll have that woman guiding me all the way to getting married. But that system has by and large uh, perpetuate the patriarchy. So the training and the guidance, which I will get from that system, which is traditional mentorship system has been claiming or, or telling me to hold the space as a woman and serve the space for men as, as the leaders, as the privilege and as the masters and me being the servant of the system. So when we are not unlearning uh, and, and changing those systems which constantly and structurally uh, nurture and groom women, then we are, we are, we are hitting the challenge. Um, and the other thing I think what we are seeing, especially now, and I'll speak specifically from uh, Africa perspective, part of, the, part of the reason that patriarchy has sustained itself is because it has a very strong punishment and reward system. Uh, what do I mean? In the continent, for example, when you are a woman, uh, you know your rights, you stand for your rights, you'll get backlash. They will they will rip your dignity to the extent you don't even have people to look up to you. And in the, in the opposite, when you are, for example, successful, but you still, you go to the patriarch, you will be praised. You will be given all the platforms. 
to speak. And we have seen women over and over again coming in and say, uh, I'm still, I'm a professional, I'm the CEO, but I still kneel to my husband. I'm still doing this. And those are the things that patriarchy reward and celebrate and they become the role model. So when we are coming with the narrative, when everyone seems like this is what pays in the system, it's become harder us to mentor it become harder to us to 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 help young girls and the same uh the same realities in the workforce you will teach girls to be authentic self but they get to the system where the authentic self is not welcomed they get backlash they get thrown out and your mentorship became a seen as as a curse rather than a blessing so i think those are some of the challenges that we're facing and we really need uh i think moving forward to invest in changing attitude changing uh beliefs but also in really dismantling the patriarchy system that is both perpetuated by men uh, and women especially women in power and women in leadership it is my call that we all of us starting to look at feminist leadership and not feminine leadership yeah, I mean, the unlearning, the patriarchy, I mean, that's this whole reason why we're here today, right? And I mean, I've never heard you, I've never heard it phrased that, you know, patriarchy has a strong punishment and reward system, but putting that in that light is going to have me thinking about that all day today now. <laughs> so thank you. That, that's going to have me pondering all day. Um, so Rupa, in thinking about solutions, um, what can organizations do to encourage and foster mentorship? Well, I think we might have lost Rupa for a second. Okay, let me go to uh, the next then. Um, Bose, so how can those who are entering the workforce find and establish a relationship with a mentor? So, um, I, I mean, I'm a big believer in, in being intentional about your career. And so, again, it's not about going into the workforce. It's about understanding um, sort of what you are uniquely designed to do. And I think, again, it kind of comes back to this purpose and value conversation. Um, so going into the workforce, um, I mean, some organizations have systems, right? So some organizations have body systems. Um, some have sponsorship systems where if you come into an organization, they actually sort of match you or pair you to somebody who can mentor you and support you on your journey. But I think it's really important, um, especially as young women um, coming into an organization to say, what exactly do I see as my pathway, right? What would I like to do? What are the, some of the things that I would like to achieve? And as we already know, if you can't see it, you can't be it. So it would be interesting for you to identify a woman within that organization that you really genuinely aspire um, to be like, for example, and kind of, you know, find a way to get in conversation to say, what's your story? what's your journey and get her to share, kind of like how we're sharing now. Um, I always say it's about the backstories, right? It's not about what you see. Um, so I think that, you know, if you found yourself in an organization that obviously didn't have a structured system, then it would be important for you to already know why, right? You want to approach this person. There's always, you know, I'm very big on when you're the mentee, understanding your own power and owning your power, because then how you show up is completely different. And when you show up to the mentor, there is just this sense that this person is coming with value, right? Because again, it comes back to these power dynamics, which unfortunately, I think a lot of young women have been burnt, right? Because of exactly what Mishi was saying. And Mishi, thank you so much for framing it in that way, because I absolutely agree that you know, we've only heard it in different ways where people say, oh, I, I didn't have a nice boss or a female, nice female boss, right? Or, you know, she told me not to wear the head scarf because, you know, she doesn't believe I should do it. This is what the law says. But really, it is systemic, right? Patrick is systemic. And whether you like it or not, we have all been socialized, right, in these systems. So 
unless you're intentional about unlearning and relearning, then you just continue to perpetuate what exists. So um, I really appreciate that. And so it's so important that we start to, you know, let young women understand that you do have power, you do have value. And regardless of who it is that you're matched with to mentor you, there is also something that you bring to the table. Yeah, that intentionality and the, I love, I always love that saying, if you can't see it, you can't be it. Um, so that's amazing. And I know you're doing that with the Elector project, which, you know, Nigeria is, is hard to navigate. Okay, <laughs> I've seen it too in my work. That is, that's a whole nother place um, with challenges of its own. But, you know, no matter where you are in the world, it is fascinating to see those systemic um, things that pop up about what you're wearing or how you say things or how you present things like it's just it's all so stupid honestly <laughs> like you it really doesn't matter at the end of the day as long as you're effective but that's the, that's my two cents um and then finally uh we're really really great question to end on for arzu so how can feminist mentorship contribute to changing our leadership and organizational culture how do we practically put these ideas into practice in the workplace? I'm going to take a detour here just because as a young woman, I've been through what, three or four different mentorship programs who have been supposed to, and I mean, I'm talking about Canada, right? The feminist Canada, um, who've been supposed to advance my leadership and who have caused me more harm than not through their paternalistic white supremacist really oppressive nature of top-down leadership. And so, you know, I've been in mentorship circles where they've given us um, uh, workshops on how to overcome imposter syndrome and how to, again, understand your power without really having an understanding of how imposter syndrome, again, as Mishi was saying, there's nothing biological about being not confident about um, under, you know, having those feelings that we now understand as or call imposter syndrome. It's all happening systematically from the day we are born, we are socialized, we are cultured, like Mishi said, into performing certain tasks through different roles and in specific ways that again, uh, uphold that patriarchal system of power. And so I think when we're talking about mentorship, when we're talking about developing feminist leadership, what we need to recognize is that a lot of young women, I'm not talking about the ones who don't have mentors who haven't taken that step to say, hey, I wanna do this, to actively seek out leadership or engagement roles specifically within a civic system. For those of us who have stepped forward, at least in Canada, again, understanding the privileges that come with being in a country where gender equality is in some ways differently advanced than other countries, we do recognize our power. We know what we want to do. We have our agendas. We understand the systems more often than not that we're interacting with in terms of racism and sexism and ableism, which is a huge thing. It's, it's the fact that a lot of times these mentorship uh, relationships and opportunities really usually just silence us and patronize us and are like oh this is how you should do it this is how it works versus okay how is this going to be reciprocal now as a powerful young woman I've stepped into this role I've volunteered how who is going to step aside who's going to pass the mic who's going to give me some of their power so that I can get to a level where my voice can have that impact where I get to share my vision and really help shift culture in terms of feminism and advancing equity so I think for me at least in North America and Canada there needs to be a, reckon a reckoning in terms of again leadership being as this thing that is taught from the top down and in terms of how you engage with institutions where whereas those institutions may not necessarily be operating in ways that advance gender equality anyway so don't teach me how to navigate patriarchy don't teach me how to navigate racism where you really need to be engaging young women marginalized women who are ex experiencing the impacts of that oppression 24 seven in dismantling those systems, in restru restructuring those systems, 
so that our power and our value is a given, is an understood fact in all of these spaces that we're interacting with. Um, and I, I think a lot of times mentorship relationships fail us because they're like, oh, as a woman, this is how I made it within the system, not recognizing that, okay, like if you had to go through this and you had to take 10 steps to get to where you are, what your the next generation is, is maybe five less steps. And maybe in 30 years, we're going to be at a place where we're all starting on a level playing field, where again, generation after generation, women don't have to go through the same struggles to get to where you are now. So again, uh, my relationship with uh, mentorship is very complicated, um, mainly because again, I'm much more focused on systemic change and deconstructing patriarchy and white supremacy and not necessarily learning how to navigate within it so that women too can access patriarchal power. Yeah, I mean, I am ferociously writing down <laughs> everything that you're saying because you said it so well. Um, yeah, I see snaps in the chat. Um, I mean, yeah, I, mentorship has to be a two-way street. It has to be a learning from, from both sides because we all have something to learn from each other. And this whole notion, and I know we've all heard it, that, well, I went through it, so now you have to, right? This whole shift in mentality needs to change. Like we appreciate, especially coming from a young, as a younger woman, like we appreciate the struggles that you went through to get to where you are, but you did it, at least you said you did it so that we wouldn't have to take that on. And so making that space intentionally, not just for show at some event to say like, oh, listen, we listen to young women, but internalizing it and giving that space internally in your organizations is key. Because otherwise you're just like, like Nishi said, I know earlier, like you're perpetuating that cycle. And instead you have people who just leave the sector altogether because we feel so scorned and so tired, right? So thank you all though, so much for sharing your wisdom. I mean, you said it all so beautifully. And now we're gonna go into the workshop portion where we can all uh, work towards um, internalizing it more and advancing it in a better way together. So with that, um, thank you all. And I turn it over to Emily. Thank you, everyone. Well, first of all, I mean, this has just been such an amazing conversation. I have all your quotes here. And really, Aritsu, don't teach me how to navigate patriarchy. Like if I ever get a tattoo, that's what I'm getting. I think guys, just <laughs> you should coin it. Um, you know, that is exactly what we face, right? These teachings and these systemic teachings that are not accidental, they're intentional. And we learn them because that's how it works. And so to unlearn them is effort and um, work and courage and you're all doing it. And it's just been really an honor to, to hear you talk. Okay, um, I have 10 minutes to uh, let our uh, wonderful um, attendees know what uh, the work that we've been doing with Helena, but also our other four amazing sisters who are not here today, but send their greetings to all of you uh, around feminist leadership. So I have two documents that really think of them as tools and starting points um, that I want to talk about. Um, the first one is the Fair Share um, Agenda for Change, Feminist Leadership for Feminist Goals. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the what and the how, because actually the how is as important as the what. Uh, and then there's a little toolkit that goes alongside it that is really just to kind of help everyone get started. Um, so yeah, so that's that's my, my task right now. So two years ago or two and a half years ago, I was in the very unpleasant situation of having to close down a wonderful feminist organization. Uh, it's a small club, um, but it sucks because, <laughs> you know, the organization is doing transformative work, but for whatever reason, uh, it just has to end. Um, I really looked and turned into to our sector, the social impact sector for ideas, thoughts, um, and also, you know, the, the feminist movement on how to do it in a way that really upheld my feminist principles, my values. And there was nothing there. Um, 
And it really kind of, you know, showed me that this idea of leadership, first of all, if you're a leader and you admit that you need to stop leading and shut something down, I mean, that's like the worst thing that you can do, right? Um, and I think there was just so much discomfort in understanding that leadership, you know, feminist leadership goes beyond the wrapping of what things look like. And it's something you have to maintain even in difficult times um, that I was just really, you know, left um, not defeated, but really frustrated with, you know, the lack of just reflection and solidarity and, pro and, and, and examples and a, a content that could guide leaders, feminist leaders through that kind of thing. So uh, I started the Feminist Leadership Project. And the reason I, I did it the way I did it was because we needed to hear examples. There were so many questions that I had that other people had about, you know, we all know amazing feminist leaders around us. Why is the sector so unable to kind of take their wisdom, lessons, experiences, and translate it into action, into, you know, um, contributions into this, in the culture, right? Integrate it into the culture. It was also a year where, you know, everybody was launching these great feminist uh, statements, you know, such and such organization is now a feminist organization. Great, but what is behind that? Um, and very, very rapidly, I met Helena and we decided to go on this journey together. And um, we created the Fair Share Action Circle because, you know, as two um, white women in our sector, we knew that we, first of all, didn't have answers, that there was a lot of work that um, we needed to do to also understand that the reality and the landscape of, you know, what our sisters were also going through in our sector. Uh, and also because feminist leadership is about collective leadership. And there was no way that we were going to go down this road without our amazing sisters uh, that joined us. And so the Fair Share Action Circle is really this engine, the thought engine, uh, the strategic thinking machine around feminist leadership. We spent a year digging deep into all of our experiences. Uh, we, uh, you know, represent a lot of different uh, experiences, backgrounds nationalities and really wanted to kind of map the landscape. What have we been through? What do we not understand? What do we understand? What do we need to do some serious intentional work on? What is actually something we've learned the hard way, but we feel, you know, as Ariza said, like we know what we're talking about. Like we have that expertise. Um, and so what came out of all of that um, is uh, the Feminist Leadership for Feminist Goals Agenda for Change. I'm gonna show it to you very quickly, but you can, uh, find it online on the Fair Share website. Um, it really is, I hope you can all see my screen, a beautiful document. Um, it's fun to read. I mean, you know, obviously I'm not objective, but um, it really takes you through our thought leadership, our thought process and why we did it the way we did. And the how for me, and I, I think for all of us, is really more important that, you know, or at least 75% of what came out of this. Uh, these are our sisters here, all of us. Um, it was a really transformative on a personal and a collective level uh, process for all of us to do this together. Um, I think the first ingredient was a very safe space where we could all show up with um, our uh, shortcomings and our strengths and our doubts and our vulnerabilities and our experiences and our trauma and our forgiveness. And I think um, the space in itself was just such a beautiful creation. And, and I think, you know, we're talking about feminist leadership as kind of this, you know, thing that's, a, you know, um, as we're looking at it for our sector, it's something that we need to reach, but it's actually in these structures, it's in these groups. And when you manage to create it together and kind of see it take form, it, it's very transformative and unique and powerful. Um, our a gender for change, you know, I just want to take you to this, yeah, this one page. We also wanted to really try to do this with humility. And I know that in, you know, a patriarchal world, the word humility can have a lot of baggage behind it. I think for us, it was really about, again, uh, being vulnerable and, and recognizing that we really didn't know a lot and that there were a lot of people around us who knew as much and so that our contribution wasn't necessarily, weren't necessarily about the answer, but more about an example of how you get to the answers. 
Uh, we recognize in it that feminist leadership is a journey. It must be transformative. Um, it must change power structures. And you know, you cannot leave that to the side. If it is not radically changing power structures within an organization, within a team, it is not feminist leadership. Uh, we were also very much, um, you know, aware uh, that it had to be intersectional. And so many of you on this panel have, you know, voiced that in such a beautiful way through your past experiences of what you've done. Um, and finally, it had to be collective. It had to be collective. And I think we were seeing, you know, our sector move towards this very, I can't remember which one of you talked about this, but hierarchical feminism of like, you know, yes, this is great. We're now, you know, our organizations are uh, embracing feminist values. Uh, and as the CEO of this huge international NGO, I myself as a feminist, you know, you would get all these statements, I am a feminist. And we're like, eh, I think you're missing the point. Like, we're happy for you. It's a great thing to be a feminist. <laughs> but, you know, where is the we? What is the transformation and what does the collective look like? Um, another thing I want to share with you before we, we break up is that we um, had to structure this in a way that felt um, that brought justice into the conversation, gender justice, racial justice, uh, you know, social justice. We really needed a structure that not only reflected our good intentions as a group, uh, but also very much reflected um, the feminist vision and the feminist ideal um, of, you know, the, that is much bigger than the social impact sector, much bigger than an organization, much bigger than a team. Um, so we structured it around purpose, people, power, and process. And I, I won't, you know, spend too much time on this. You can um, discover it at your own pace. And there's always someone that, at Fair Share that's super eager to, to answer any questions or take you through this. Um, but it was important for us to um, use these four kind of grounding concepts um, to take us through, through this process also. Um, basically, the agenda for change is a series of questions. Again, we don't claim to have invented, you know, uh, the moon. We are really just putting out there a set of questions that can be transformative, that can be a, a, a starting point to this journey that is you know, an intentional um, feminist leadership approach. Uh, and these questions are both for individuals, this is work that you can do by yourself and for the collective, uh, because we think that, you know, obviously you can't do one without the other. So this is our agenda for change. You know, since we've launched, we've had um, beautiful um, feedback from folks of, of, of what it, you know, did for them. I think a lot of people were already doing this work, right, in their organizations in different ways. And this was just an added tool for them um, to keep keep doing that and, and to maybe, you know, um, get on the balcony, as you say, and look at the process from a, um, um, a in a way that helped, helped it move forward. Um, so this is the first document. I, if I can, I don't know if people are now, oh no, I have to reshare my screen. Uh, let's see, here we go. I wanna very rapidly show you our toolkit um, that is you know, a very short, let me see, I should know this. It's probably 15 pages, a very short toolkit that helps you take this agenda for change and really put it into practice. Um, you know, we all know that having a printed, you know, um, report is not the same as having, you know, an, a, a really um, user friendly toolkit. So we created this to help people bring this, you know, to concrete conversations, bring this to concrete uh, processes within their organizations, um, and to really help build, um, you know, your understanding and your, and your plan. Uh, to move forward. So it's organized around different worksheets. The first one is build your own definition of feminist leadership. You know, in all the, well, the few interviews or even exchanges that we've had since we started this, people always ask us, so what is your definition of feminist leadership? And I always want to tell them, I don't know yet. I mean, I'm, I'm living it. It's hard. It's complicated. And so we never wanted to bring a definition, a single-handed definition to what that is, but we wanted to bring a tool that enables people to explore that for themselves. Um, so the first worksheet is really about that, that is the starting point. And you know, we spend hours, and by hours, I mean hours, 
talking about what is feminist leadership. Um, and I can't see Helen's face right now, but um, yeah, she's smiling. That's what I thought. <laughs> um, it never ends. We're still having that conversation. Um, the second, um, sorry, that is the first worksheet. We also give you guiding questions. You know, I think that a I lot of you- question about this. Is there time yeah. for us to ask questions or? Is it what, sorry? I have a question about what you're just talking about. Go ahead. I have a question mainly because I, I wonder in what ways where, because I know again, like your audience is very diverse and international, obviously, but in what ways were marginalized women engaged in that process of you deciding to have, not necessarily have directions or directives for what feminist leadership can look like, mainly because I can definitely see this like being co-opted by feminists who are not necessarily trans inclusive, who don't necessarily have a taste for, you know, racial justice. And to again, yeah reinvent those same ideas of feminism that for so long have been further marginalizing black women indigenous women racialized women um upholding like values of imperialism so um yeah. uh, you know what 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 has been worked on around that in terms of like harm reduction or necessarily bringing in intersectionality and just you know anti-oppression as a core function of feminist leadership yeah absolutely it's been a big work in progress. And we certainly, after six months of being the action circle, uh, because of just where we were at in our conversation and what was happening in the world, really took a deep dive into those questions and made some um, recommendations isn't the right word, made some plans to improve that, right? So we are six feminists from various backgrounds, um, what we have done is at different moments really let you know one of our sisters lead when it was the right moment for all of us to st take a step back so for example when the black lives matter movement was really at its peak in the u.s um our sister zakia carr johnson who's the founder of uh black women disrupt was the one leading us as a group through that conversation and that process We've recognized that six is certainly not representative of the entirety of you know, the feminist movement and women that we um, you know, um, aim at, um, well, not representing, because we don't aim at representing folks, but women who should be at the table. Uh, Helen can talk about steps that we've taken to try and, and, and make that wider, make that group wider. Um, we are doing work, and again, I, fair, you know, Fair Share is doing work, so really Helen can give you more information, but on um, racial justice now and looking at also, you know, what, what we're looking at in terms of data on the fair, sh fair Share side of things. So which women are we talking about when we are looking at, at you know, women in leadership? We have a long way to go. Uh, you know, we don't have... Um, folks on in our circle right now who represent, uh, you know, uh, certain groups. And I think that that is a problem and we've recognized it's a problem and we are expanding the second year um, to try and really broaden that group. But our goal was also, and I think, you know, for me, this is interesting because our goal was also to be, for those groups to use our goal was for this tool to be the conversation and, and, and bridge to other actions that we are then not the ones taking because it's not up to us to take. And we have had, again, you know, groups, and Helen, you can talk more about these groups, but groups forming based on this work that are taking their own agenda forward and who actually don't need us to be part of it because it's their agenda and you know, it's, their, it's their space. So we're also working with partner organizations who represent different constituencies to see how this tool can be of use to them. Um, and finally, you know, the thing I'll say is that we also know kind of who the audience is for this particular tool. Uh, we really did a lot of work when we started the Fair Share Action Circle to discuss, okay, who is this for? You know, and if, you know, we're being super transparent here, this is for people who are on that other side, right? Um, a lot of people who have used this tool have come back to us saying, 
this is step one for me. So this is this was never a tool for um, experienced feminist leaders, if you want, that have learned those lessons, had those life experiences and those professional experiences, and are far be, far further down the fight. Right. This was really you know people coming to us saying in a team of 300 or in a in an organization of 300 i'm the only one who can ever use the word feminist like help me out here so i think the audience is also you know important um and as we continue phase two and this action circle grows and we look at what you know issues we want to focus on that will also change um so i hope that was a an answer to to your question and remark. So um, yeah, this is the toolkit. Um, and, you know, it's, we've had some really good feedback from that kind of audience that said, you know, this was a kind of a um, an enabler of that first conversation in different settings in the social impact sector. Um, and that's really what we wanted it to be. Um, so that's, that's for our work. Let me just Stop sharing. Helen, I feel there are things to add, um, both for Arisa's points and um, some of the things I mentioned, if you want to do that now. Um, I can give it a try. I wrote some things in the in the chat because for me, it's really, um, it started as a process where we intentionally brought together six women with very different perspectives to start this unlearning in a safe space without, and that's still not the goal or objective to then give answers to the world, <laughs> claiming that we have now uh, um, found the, the solution to feminist leadership or to how to be a feminist leader. So I think, what was the key for me is being able to be part of this, these sort of conversations and starting this unlearning on my part with the help of these different perspectives and women who challenged me. We had some really, really tough conversations um, where I was confronted with my shortcomings, my biases, my privileges, my not understanding. And so what we then try to do is write down what this meant to us and what it did to us without saying this is how anyone else should do it, but with the hope to inspire others to find their way to talk about these really complex issues. And yes, our background is really organizations working in the social impact sector, but obviously looking at both individuals who are in these organizations and in these structures that have been creating harm, but have harmed employees and partners also a lot. And we want to spark this conversation. And I have no idea where exactly it would take us. <laughs> um, and, uh, and there might be people who do this in completely different ways. And that's now what we hope to learn um, and develop further with others. So this is really from six people, that's it. <laughs> without claiming to represent, without claiming to know it all, rather the opposite. And so it's really about us sharing that personal journey and hoping to inspire others, but especially learn from others how they would do it, what we've missed, what needs to be added, uh, and all that. So, um, and I think it's it's really the, the the second part to what we try to do in in kind of monitoring women in leadership. So that's where the two worlds where we try to bring them together: feminist leadership and women leadership. That um, that we also want to take on the challenge to to show intersectionality and find ways to show how, what the status is, but also how we can advance this, both by monitoring certain um, aspects of it, but by looking at it from this feminist leadership perspective that of course can't measure <laughs> progress with 
numbers or data only. So um, that's my my piece of um, um, kind of adding to Emily's comments from my perspective. And if I have time to just add 30 seconds to that, um, <laughs> the actually, and sorry, I should have been clear about this, the content for the agenda for change was actually also the analysis of all of the feminist leadership contributions. So we really did a really cool um, qualitative data analysis process that took us to identify these four pillars. And we also, you know, uh, so we used, you know, with their obviously uh, con consent, uh, the contributions of all of these women and one man uh, from the Feminist Leadership Project to really take a deep dive into what people were saying and the patterns that we were seeing. Um, and, you know, th that pool of feminist leadership um, um, uh, folks that are on that project is, you know, it is what it is. I think it's a beautiful, very diverse pool. There are also folks missing and we continue to, to, to try and, and, and um, uh, profile as many people as we can. So if you have recommendations of someone who you think should be on the Feminist Leadership Project, please send, uh, send them our way. But it was also really, really coming from what all these folks have said, have said had said. Um, so it wasn't just coming out of our brains, if I can put it that way, uh, because as Helen said, what comes out of our brain is not, you know, um, the answer or the only thing. Uh, so it was really feeding from, you know, what all these leaders had shared, the patterns that we saw, and we worked with some pretty cool feminist leaders who are not part of the action circle, who came in and kind of helped us frame the discussion a certain way also. Um, so yeah, that's how we did it. All right, I'm conscious of time and I still want to engage our audience. Um, so because they, they accidentally gave us this in webinar format instead of um, the meeting format, we're going to transfer to another room. So I'm going to put the Zoom link in the chat. So if everyone could please just go into that Zoom link, that way we can go actually into our breakout rooms and we can actually do the workshop portion. So please transfer now. <laughs> <laughs>